you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Revelation chapter 2. And we've been uh, looking at the seven churches, and um, we're going to look at another one of those today. And uh, we're in uh, verse 18. Revelation 2, verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Father, thank you, Lord, for your book. Thank you, Lord, that we're gathered together this morning. And um, God bless your people this morning. We pray that everyone that has come will take away something, Lord, that will help them, Lord, in the days to come. Lord, help us now by your Spirit. And Lord, we will give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, in verse 18, it starts off there, uh, unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things saith the Son of God. And, um, you know, I don't think I have to remind you this, but it, sometimes it's easy to lose sight of this. Um, it's all about Him. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. This thing of Christianity and the church and, and you know, all that stuff, you know, the bottom line is it's all about Him. And as long as it stays all about Him, it works, and it's blessed, and it brings joy, and it keeps us on the right ter- track. But man, when it gets about a personality, or about, you know, me, or about, or about something, you know, something else, um, it's, it's off track. Uh, these things saith the Son of God, and He is in the midst of the churches. And you see Him here in this verse, He draws attention to his eyes and his feet, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Um, you know, the Lord is very aware, and he is always watching, and he sees the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. And um, he's watching, but it draws attention to his feet. In chapter 2, verse 1, it says, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He sees, and he's walking around, and he's just aware of everything that's going on. Verse 19, he addresses the church in Thyatira, and he sees much good in this church. He says, I know thy works. You know, each, each church, as the Lord addresses them, first he identifies himself in one way or another. And then he says, I know thy works. And, and that statement is the same with each one. But when he gets past that phrase, then he highlights something that's different about each one. For example, um, look at uh, verse 9 of chapter 2. I know thy works. He says that to every church. I know thy works. 
and tribulation and poverty. Look at verse 13 to the church at Pergamos. I know thy works and where thou dwellest. So he highlights something about each one. In the church in Thyatira in verse 19, he says, I know thy works and charity and service and faith. Um, he knew their works, but he knew their charity. And that's really an amazing statement because this is the only church that he brings that up. And the Lord puts a real high priority on that thought of charity. And of course, it, it's, it's not in the sense that our society uses the term. He's not talking about, you know, you know, throwing money at do-gooder causes, and some of that's all good, but that's not the Bible use of the word charity. The Bible use of the word charity, a whole chapter is given to it in 1 Corinthians 13. And uh, man, it is, it is the love of God. It is the long-suffering love of God. It is the selfless love, and it's, it's that love when it works through us. That's called charity. And he addresses this church and he says, man, he says, I, I know thy works and charity. You know, the church at Thyatira was the kind of a church where there was a real sweet spirit there. The Bible says charity is the bond of perfectness. Charity is the glue. Man, it just, it just holds, you get, you get charity in a home, you get charity in a church uh, the Bible says, charity shall cover the multitude of sins. You know, some people are only too glad to see everything that's wrong. But when charity is in motion, charity looks beyond all that. And uh, man, just the love of God just, just reaches out, even, even in places where you're being provoked. He looked at this church, and man, there was a lot of love going on in this church. A lot of long-suffering love, a lot of selfless love. He said at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, And now abideth faith, hope, charity. But the greatest of these is charity. Charity is the one thing that will continue on into eternity. You know, faith will be gone the moment we step into eternity or the moment the rapture happens and we're called out of here and suddenly we're in our glorified body, you know what? We won't need faith because faith deals with things that are not seen. But suddenly when we are in that place where we're with the Lord, we don't, we don't have to have faith anymore. We'll see it all. Hope is based on something that is coming and it's a certainty, but it also is not seen. And he said, and now abideth faith, hope, and charity, but the greatest of these is charity. And the reason charity was the greatest was because it goes right on into eternity and it never ceases. He said, I know thy works and charity and service and faith. You know, in all these churches, the Lord did not mention their faith. Now, he mentions in... Uh, in uh, one of the churches, he says, thou hast not denied my faith. Talking about, you know, their, their, their belief in Jesus Christ. But here in this one, he says, I know thy faith. And thy patience and thy works. You notice he says works twice. He says at the beginning of the verse, I know thy works. And then at the end of the verse, he says it again, and thy works and the last to be more than the first. You know, however long this church had been in existence, they were actually doing more for the Lord at the moment this letter was written. This letter was written about 90 AD. They were doing more for the Lord at this point than they were doing even at their beginning. And that's really unusual. You know, uh, churches and Christians tend to start off with a bang and then then, you know, over time, you know, they, they tend to lose momentum. But this church had not lost its momentum. Um, their, their works, as of the time this letter was written, were even greater. They were doing far more for the Lord now than the day that church had been birthed. There was a lot of good in this church. But there was something that was glaringly wrong. 
And when the Lord pointed out some of these errors, it was never his goal to, to, to nitpick or to, um, you know, oh, I've got to find something wrong with these people. Um, you know, we don't appreciate people like that. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you don't. I hope you're not one of them. But, um, um, you know, I, there's, there's always people that, um, I heard Jordan Peterson say this. He said, there's always people that, that you know, you'll clean your whole house up. And uh, they'll walk in and they'll they'll point out the one thing that you missed, and uh, and you know it's it's like they didn't see all the rest they just they just saw the one thing, and um, uh, our Lord is not like that. Our Lord is not like that. Um, our Lord is not of this mindset that He's got to find something wrong with us. Now there's lots wrong with us. There's lots. He wouldn't have to search very long. But that's never what he's trying to do. I had a professor in Bible school, and uh, he taught um, one of the classes on um, customs that we had. And, and he was a great guy, and we loved him. And he was a riot, but he was, um, he was a character. And um, he, um, he, he, he must have had dyslexia back before they called it that. And so he would, you know, I remember one day in class, there was about 60 or 70 of us in the classroom. And so he's calling off our names. And um, once he decided your name, like if he mispronounced your name, that was forever your name after that. Um, and, and people, he, he'd go through roll calls, especially those first couple weeks. And he'd call people's names and he'd say this person's name. And they would say, sir, my name is. And he'd say, okay. But that didn't matter what they said because he was still going to call them what he thought their name was. And... Um, and he was the kind of guy that when you when you did an exam, um, you know, in every in every college classroom, you've got, you know, you've got some students. We man, we had quite an age group. We had we had middle aged guys in our classes and we had we had 18 year olds in our classes. And some of them were sharp and some of them were struggling and some of them hadn't studied in years. And uh, so you had quite a quite a spectrum in that classroom. And I remember that he would. Um, he would, he would grade our tests, and he would always make the statement. He was really proud of it, too. He said, he said now, I don't believe in a perfect score. And um, so it, it didn't matter if you had went 110% and had, you know, double the requirements. Um, you, you know, he was, you might get an 85 on your, and somebody else that hadn't done half of what you did get a 95. And that was just the way he was. He, he, um, he just... He felt like he had to take people down a peg and he had to find his, he, he'd, he'd find it even if it wasn't there. Our Lord isn't like that. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. You know, he's the one that, if you're a believer here this morning, he's the one that um, even when you're doing great, he is going to, he's going to bring up everything. I, he's going to bring up stuff you did 10 years ago. Okay, the, the Lord doesn't do that. When the Lord forgives, it is blotted out, and he treats you as though it was never committed. You ought to look up the word forgive. Some people don't understand that word. But when the Lord forgives us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He treats us as though it never occurred. I like that kind of forgiveness, don't you? So when the Lord points out something in these churches, He's not trying to find fault. No doubt there were many faults in any of these churches as there is in any church. But when the Lord pointed out something here, it was something that was detrimental to their existence. It was something that was going to take away all the good stuff. It was going to kill their charity and kill their faith and kill their service if they didn't deal with it. And that was our Lord's purpose in bringing these things up. So when it comes to the church of Thyatira, he brings something up, and it's hard to believe that this could exist in a church. But churches are amazing. They're all different. Look at, um, look at verse 20. 
The Lord says, notwithstanding, that means in spite of all the good things that you have, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Boy, the name Jezebel, there's, there's names that um, in the Bible that almost every person that's, that's had, you know, if you've heard any of the Bible stories, there's a few names that, that you know right away. You know, you got Noah, and right away you think of the ark. And, um, you, got, uh, you got all sorts of names. And, and, you know, on the flip side of this name, Jezebel, you've got names like Judas. Judas. Man, everybody knows who Judas is. And the Lord says, Thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach. Boy, what is in a name? That name Jezebel, it, it brings up, there was a woman in that church, and the Lord said, she's exactly like her. And the Lord points back to an Old Testament example. And so let's look at a few verses. Keep your place there in, in, in Revelation 2. And go back with me to 1 Kings 16. A woman named Jezebel had been a problem to the people of God centuries earlier. And you know, a lot of these Bible characters, they still live. Oh, I, not, not, not that same person, but you know, there's, there's, there's people out there that are like Peter, and there's people out there that are like John, and, and there's people out there like Solomon, and people, there's people, those characters still, still live. Look at 1 Kings 16, verse 29. And in the thirty and eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria twenty and two years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam. The sins of Jeroboam, Jeroboam had introduced two golden calves to keep people from going to the right place of worship. As if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. You know, the wording of verse 31 is interesting. The Lord's talking about how, you know, how terrible, you know, and, and, and he says, if it had been a light thing for him to follow, those golden calves became a problem from the days of Jeroboam, and they were, they were the ruin of Israel. And uh, man, each, each successive king, they just kept that thing going. And he says, you know what was worse than worshiping the golden calves? He took to wife Jezebel. He said that was worse. Look at chapter 18. You're right there. 1 Kings 18. God has sent a famine on the land, and uh, it hasn't rained because of the prayers of Elijah the prophet. And in chapter 18, verse 1, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria, and Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. Now watch verse 4. For it was so, when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave, 
and fed them with bread and water. Um, Jezebel had killed a bunch of the prophets of the Lord. Okay, so verse 13 of the same chapter. Obadiah is talking to Elijah in verse 13. He says, was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? How I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by 50 in a cave and fed them with bread and water. Look at verse 17. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So you had the prophets of Baal, and then you have the prophets of the grove. And the grove, literally, it would be a, a large grove of evergreen trees, and they were grown to give them cover. And, you know, some of the most wicked um, acts that they could possibly commit were committed in the groves. And that's why the Lord always brought that up. And that's also why the Lord was thrilled when occasionally, once in a while, a king would rise up and he would destroy the groves. But it's interesting. He said the prophets of the groves ate at Jezebel's table. Look at uh, chapter 19, verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets, the prophets of Baal, with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. She said, Within 20, she said, You send Elijah a message. She said, within 24 hours, he's a dead man. She said, I'm going to see to it. That's the kind of woman um, Jezebel was. In chapter 21, you have a famous story. And um, Ahab decided that he wanted a certain vineyard. And the man that owned that vineyard was named Naboth. And so Ahab, he approached it, right? He, he came to him. He said, I want to buy your vineyard. He said, I'll, I'll pay full price for it. I'll give you more than you want. I'll give you a better vineyard. But Naboth um, did not feel that he could sell that to Ahab because it was part of his inheritance. And uh, under Old Testament law, a lot of that was not supposed to be sold off. And so he, he told the king, can you imagine telling the king? Um, he said, king, he said, I, I can't do this. So Ahab comes home. Now Ahab is the king. And Ahab came home, and he is sore and displeased, and he gets in bed, and he won't eat. Sounds like a real man's man. And uh, he gets in bed, and he won't eat. You know, hey, there's more than one vineyard. I mean, Israel's a large place. Surely he could have found another one. But he goes home. He has a pity party. He throws a tantrum, and uh, Jezebel comes in the room. Jezebel, being the sweet, submissive character that she was, caring, so loving, you know, and uh, she came in. And she said, what's the matter with you? And she said, well, I, I tried to buy Naboth's vineyard, and he won't sell it to me. And, um, and I offered even a better vineyard, and he wouldn't give it to me. And Jezebel said, you let me handle this. She said, I'll get you that vineyard. That woman knew no bounds, and she had no compassion whatsoever. It was going to be her way or the highway, or a graveyard for somebody. That was Jezebel. So she sends some of her messengers, and she says, there's going to be a feast today. She said, get Naboth and put him up in one of the high spots where everybody can see what's going on. She said, wait till about halfway through the, through the, uh, through the feast, and then accuse him of blasphemy, bring in three or four false witnesses. And she said, then we can stone him to death. You know, that was their, that was their, they didn't have rifles back then, so they, they stoned you to death. So it all played out. Man, they, they took him outside and they stoned him to death. And a little while later, she walks in the door and she says, Ahab, she says, you can have your vineyard. I took care of it. Look at 2 Kings chapter 9. 2 Kings chapter 9. 
In this chapter, Jehu, God raises him up and he is going to wipe out the bloodline of Ahab by the order of God Almighty because of all the evil. And God has waited and waited and waited. And in 2 Kings 9, verse 22, And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. Look at verse 30. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. And she painted her face and tired her head and looked out a window. And you know, it's one of the famous things the Holy Ghost records about her. And you know, it's it's not it's not that she was um, you know, the, the problem was not that she was trying to make herself look nice. The problem was she she knew how to bring men under her power, and she was gonna try it again. Verse 30, and she painted her face and tired her head and looked out at a window. And as Jehu entered in at the gate, she said, had Zimri peace who slew his master? She knew something was up. And he lifted up his face to the window and said, who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. And he said, throw her down. So they threw her down. And some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses and he trode her underfoot. And when he was come in, he did eat and drink and said, Go, see now this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. And they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Wherefore they came again and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel. And the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, this is Jezebel. You know, um, um, in, in Revelation 2 there, he's, the Lord says to the church, he said, he said, you know, I look at your church there in Thyatira, and he said, man, there's some good stuff there. He said, there's some good things going on. But he said, but boy, there is, there is something really wrong here. And he says, you have allowed that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication. There was a spirit there. And when God looked down, God says, I've, I've seen this before. He saw that woman in that church that had somehow risen to a place where they were actually handing her the pulpit. And, and God looked down and he saw that woman. He said, I have seen this before. And he said, Jezebel, she calleth herself a prophetess. You guys will remember a few weeks ago, we, we, um, we looked in, at another church where the Lord said there was a group in the church that was calling themselves Jews. They say they are Jews and are not. And how, how that bothered the Lord. And this woman, she called herself a prophetess. And you know, it's always... Uh, it's always a red flag when somebody comes and they're, they're just so ready to proclaim their own credentials and, and how great they are and how wonderful they are. You know, in Acts chapter 6, verse 3, they chose the first deacons. And when that occasion came um, to be, the, the apostles said to the church, look out among you seven men of honest report. In other words, there's got to be some men out there in the crowd that everybody knows. They, they don't have to volunteer. They don't have to, you know, show you all the good stuff they did and bring out their little resume. He said, no. He said, they'll have an honest report. It, it will be known of them. God said in 1 Corinthians 8, if any man love God, the same is known of him. There's something about loving the Lord and being his and serving him that you know, other people just pick up on that. In Acts 13, when they chose Saul and Barnabas, the Holy Ghost spoke to the church and said, separate me, Saul. The Holy Ghost spoke. 
But somehow this church, they had, they had let this woman and uh, she had said she was a prophetess and, and um, they were letting her teach. But as she was gaining momentum, she was doing some things secretly. She was seducing the Lord's servants. And that would be a private thing. You know, that's not something you do in front of the whole room. There was her public side and her private side. Well, that's a frightening thing, is it not? You know, a, a real Christian that loves the Lord, um, you know, your private side and your public side match. You don't got a private side, do you, that you're hoping nobody will find out? She did. She had her public side where she'd get up and she'd teach. And she had her private side. And with her private side, she was trapping God's servants. She was trapping them. She was ruining them. Look at Acts 15 for just a moment. Acts 15, the early church gets together and they're, they're having a, a big meeting because... Um, some, some of the Jews had come in and they were trying to make those New Testament believers still operate um, with Old Testament rituals and ceremonies and all that. And, and they were saying that, you know, these Gentile believers had to be circumcised or they couldn't be saved. And so, boy, that really caused a stir. And they had this big meeting. The outcome of the meeting is found in uh, verse um, 28, Acts 15, 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. Here's Jezebel, and she is up there, and she is, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't really understand. It's hard for me to picture, but she is absolutely overthrowing the, the whole direction of that church, the whole direction of the early church, and she is teaching them that, you know, it's okay to ignore some things God said. Um, she said, you can, you can go ahead and eat that stuff offered to idols. And Paul told us, of course, in 1 Corinthians, the idol is nothing. But he said, but, but those things that they offer to idols, they offer to devils. And he said, and that's why you're steer clear of that. Look at verse 21 of Revelation 2. Verse 21. It says, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication. And she repented not. I gave her space. You know, to me, I, I, just, I just marvel at um, the, the grace of God and the kindness of God. Um, you would think that, um, you know, the Lord would have just, you know, the Lord would have just come in and just taken care of business and got rid of her just right away. But you know what the Lord did? He gave her space. He gave her time. He gave her space to repent. In the, in the other messages to the churches, the Lord told several of the other churches that the whole church needed to repent. But at Thyatira, he didn't say that. He said that Jezebel needed to repent, and he said, and those that were committing adultery with her. He said, I gave her space. Um, you know, the Lord did that before the flood came. The Lord gave people space. He gave them about 120 years. You know, some people think that you know, because God hasn't dropped the hammer on me that, you know, I'm okay. You know, God, God must be okay. Um, you know, God is, God is blessing me. You know, everything's okay. Um, but he's just giving him space. He's giving him time. Judgment was coming for Jezebel. And he mentions it there in the verses coming up. He says, I, he says, I know what I'm going to do. But he said, I'm giving her a chance to turn around. I'm giving her a chance to change her mind. I'm giving her space. 
Is the Lord giving you space this morning? Thank God he gives us space. And boy, there's a lot of us in this room that could testify of how thankful we are that God gave us some space. And you know what he was waiting? He, he, he was waiting. He was calling. He was speaking. You know, he was trying to get us to overcome our, our, you know, our crazy thinking. And uh, he's calling us. You know, um, that's what the Lord does with the lost is he sent his son. He paid their sin debt in his own blood on the tree. Because God so loved the world with his great love wherewith he loved us. And he died. He took our sins. The debt was paid. And he rose from the dead to show he was God and God was satisfied. And uh, it's, it's all done. It is a finished work. And all any person needs to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is that thing where, you know, you're, you're, you're turning to him. You know, it's, it's, you're turning to him. You're not, you know, you're not, you're not, it's not about joining a church or joining a group or it, it's about him. And you're believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord said, I gave him space. Does the Lord knock on your heart sometimes? I think most of the people in this room are saved, but I, I, I know, I know, I'm certain. I'm certain they're not all saved in this room this morning. And you know, some of the hardest people to reach are people that have, um, they've made a profession somewhere and they've told everybody for years that they're saved. Um, Fred Brown was an evangelist that preached uh, in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And he was a great preacher and he, my dad got a hold of one of his messages and he was talking about a meeting that he preached at. And he said, I preached on, you know, how to be a Christian and why you need to be one. And uh, he said it was a great service. He said, man, he said, you could really feel the conviction of the Holy Ghost that particular evening. And he said, several people responded. And he said, I said, I had been at that church several times. And he said, I knew those folks and they knew me and I'd been out to eat with them. I'd been in their homes. And he said, um, all of a sudden, the, the head deacon, it was a large church, the head deacon came down the aisle and he, he knelt down. And as he came up, he said, there was nobody going to talk to him. And I thought, why did he come? He said, I didn't preach to Christians tonight. He said, this invitation has nothing to do with Christians. And he said, I got on my uh, knees beside him. And I said, I, he said, uh, John, why did you come? And he said, because I need to get saved. And Fred Brown said, because you need to get what? He said, I need to get saved. He said, I've been playing a game all these years. He said, when I was a little boy in a Southern Baptist church one night, they had a meeting like this, and I raised my hand, and I wanted to be saved. And he said, I came forward, and they, they took a card, and then they, they wrote a couple things on it. Next thing I knew, I was in the baptistry, and they were baptizing me. He said, from that day to this, he said, I've told everybody I'm saved. Everybody thinks I'm saved. He said, I'm humiliated. I'm going to shame my wife by doing this. He said, everybody in this church is going to think I've lost my mind. But he said, but I've, I've played this game too long. I don't know the Lord. He said, I've never been saved. He said, tonight, I'm going to trust Jesus Christ. I got a question. Have you trusted Jesus Christ? Truly? Like you had a feeling, you know, you, you experienced something, um, um, you, you prayed a prayer, you did something. Okay, great. But did you get saved? I mean, did you become a new creature in Christ? Ye must be born again. It's a new life. And something changes in your, in your world, and it's not because of anything you do. It's just because you turned to Him, and He got in you. Did that happen to you? I'm not trying to make anybody doubt your salvation, but I'm here to tell you if you're lost, here you are, and it's 12.03 on August the 11th, and he's still giving you space. Still giving you space. A little, little more space. He's hoping, you'll, he's hoping you'll call on his name before judgment falls. 
He gives the worst space. He gave Jezebel space. I wouldn't have given her space. I would have killed her. I would have killed her. Isn't it wonderful God's not like us? Are you lost here this morning? He's calling you. He's giving you space to repent. Let's bow our heads. Someday you'll look back and you'll say, boy, I remember. God called my name many a day and he gave me lots of space. Hey, Christian, th this is written to Christians. Maybe, maybe there's something that he's given you space to repent. Something that's going to wreck your... Isn't that funny? What was going to wreck this church was a bunch of immorality. And boy, isn't that the curse of our day? And you know what God's doing? He's giving you space. But he wants you to drop it like a hot potato and turn to him. He wants it dropped. He's giving you space. The piano's going to play. If God has spoken to you, why don't you talk to him? The Lord's waiting, but he won't wait forever. Lord, bless your truth, and God, wherever you have spoken to someone today, God, may, they, may you keep it in front of them, Lord, and may they know that in your great love to them, Lord, you are speaking to them, and help them, God, that they will respond to you while they can. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.